Well, good morning, and welcome to week two of our communion series. If you weren't here last week, I really do want to challenge you to go back and take a listen to that teaching because these teachings will build on top of each other. So in order to better understand what we're talking about today, it'd be great if you had the context of last week. So we began by talking about why we're doing this series. And part of the reason was that if we were to sit down and talk with each person in this room about what communion is, we would have many, many different experiences and backgrounds that have informed our views. We might even call it different things, right? Like the Eucharist, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, ordinance, sacrament, or common meal, or as we call it around here, communion. But those differences don't just lie in what we call it, rather in what we believe actually happens during it. So get this, there's almost no church on earth that does not practice communion as a recurring part of their gatherings. So it should be, as Jesus intended it to be, a source of unity. But ironically and sadly, there is perhaps no greater dividing point for Jesus's church than this practice. Now, my friends and I experienced what that division feels like this one time in college when we visited a Greek Orthodox church. I talked about this a few months ago and spoke about some of the elements of that gathering that seemed pretty foreign to me. Like, for instance, all the songs were in Greek. How many of you speak Greek? Yeah, pretty much no one, right? Well, it seemed to me that everyone in that congregation did speak Greek because they knew the words or maybe they were just singing words that they didn't know what they meant, but they knew them by heart, right? And it seemed to me that everybody kept standing up and sitting down at these super random times, but they obviously weren't random times because everybody but me and my friends knew when to stand up and when to sit down. They also knew what to say as they stood up and sit down. And then at one point, the priest was walking around the stage and he was humming something or singing. And he had this chain and on the bottom of that chain was a box and he was swinging that box and there was smoke coming out of it. Right. And I'd never seen anything like this. So I was super confused. And honestly, during the course of this whole service, I felt super, super uncomfortable. But whatever level of discomfort I felt leading up to that moment, I mean, it was very minimal compared to the discomfort that I was going to feel when they moved into the time of taking sacrament together. So the priest blessed it. And then he explained what he believed had just happened as he blessed it. And then every official member of the Greek Orthodox Church, and they made that really clear only official members of the Greek Orthodox Church uh, were invited to come forward and receive this thing called the Eucharist. Now, no one else even touched the bread. The priest actually put it in their mouth. And so this whole time, I'm feeling really uncomfortable. But as I look back now, what I realized was I was feeling something. And I think what I was feeling was anger. I was feeling anger because here I am, a Bible college student, somebody who is now committing my life to studying the Bible, who's going to spend my life teaching people scripture. I'm thinking, I'm part of your family. And I'm sitting there feeling isolated, feeling rejected, feeling like I don't belong. And as I was preparing to teach this message today, I wondered how many of you have felt like that here. Because the method that we use when we take communion is very different than what you grew up with. Or because the way that we talk about communion seems kind of foreign to you. And so this time that we kind of build up as the pinnacle of our gathering, this thing that we talk about, that should be a source of unity and looking around at everybody else and saying, we're in this thing together, actually for you feels like a time of isolation and rejection. We never, ever want anybody to feel like that in this place again. So that's why we're doing this series. Last week, we said that communion sets our hearts and minds on the work of Jesus Christ. 
his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So the first element of this setting our minds and hearts is this word remember. So we remember that he has freed us from slavery and he's invited us into a new life. So we remember how God has acted in the past to bring deliverance. And we sang that song, we're free, we're free, forever we're free. And then kind of an invitation, come join the song of all the redeemed, right? But communion actually goes beyond that. It's not just about remembering. It's about what God is doing now. So today, what we're going to talk about is how communion is a time for us to recognize that he is with us, nourishing us with everything we need to live in freedom. Today, we're going to look at how God is with us and he is leading us somewhere. Now, there are basically five major views of what happens at the Lord's Supper. And I was going to do a overview of all those, but then I realized I was going to take the whole time. And so what we're going to do instead is we'll record a deep dive podcast this week and we'll take some time exploring in depth what all of these different theologies are, how they're different. And uh, we'll have that up by Wednesday, the middle of the week, and it'll be on the app under the audio section. So for anybody that uh, didn't care to listen to that, anybody that's excited for the fact that we're not going to be doing that this morning, you're welcome. So let's go back to what happens immediately following the Passover story where we left the Israelites last week. Remember, God has just broken the chains of their captivity He has just delivered them from this agonizing and grueling and hopeless life that they were stuck in under the reign of this tyrannical leader. Then, as you might already know, Pharaoh, he actually changes his mind and he tracks them down and he pins them against the Red Sea. But God does this incredible miracle and he enables them to cross through the sea on dry ground, bringing the waters crashing down on Pharaoh's soldiers. Then the Israelites have this amazing worship celebration and they're dancing and they're singing and there's tambourines and it's just amazing celebration. And then they realize they're in a wilderness and they're getting thirsty and they can't seem to find any water. And their children are starting to ask them, hey, can I have something to drink? And their children are starting to ask them, hey, what's for dinner? Have you guys ever been in that situation where your kid's like, hey, what's for dinner? And then you just mess with them and you're like, oh, no, we're not going to eat dinner tonight. And they're like, what? Well, the Israelite children were actually experiencing that, right? They're not having anything for dinner. And we actually don't know where we're going to get our next meal from. So, This continues on for three days and Abraham's descendants are starting to get worried. Their astonishment at what God has done turns into fear that that same God might have brought them out here in the wilderness just to die. The murmuring among themselves about how wonderful it was when God did this thing, when he did that thing, when he delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians, that murmuring turns into grumbling among themselves about all the things that God wasn't doing yet, like giving them water, like giving them food. So they did the thing that makes perfect sense. And this is Exodus 15, 24. The people complained against Moses saying, what should we drink? And Moses cried out to the Lord. Now the Israelites didn't cry out to the Lord as they did as the inciting incident for this whole thing, right? That started this whole process of the Exodus. They cried out, which is to say that they pleaded for intervention, but they don't do that here. They don't even do that with Moses. They complain to Moses, the guy who also hasn't had anything to eat or drink, who's also been trying to lead them to a place with water, whose efforts have so far been quite fruitless in finding them water. And who, by the way, never actually wanted this job in the first place. Why are they complaining? because they don't know how to live in freedom. In fact, God acts when Moses approaches him about the water and he brings them to a nice little place with 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, quite specific, I know. But four verses later, 
This is what the people conclude. If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Right? So they're complaining now three days, three days after God has just brought them to this amazing place with the provision of water, they're complaining. And this is when God tells them their meal plan, which is this. He's going to send them quail every evening and he's going to send them bread every morning. Now, for our purposes this morning, we'll only spend time talking about the bread. Here's how it worked. Every morning when they woke up after the dew disappeared, there was going to be this layer of fine flaky substance. It was white. It looked something like coriander seed. And it was such a strange looking food that people called it. What is it? That's what manna means. What is it? So somebody's like, what is it? And the other guys, what is it? And he's like, I know that's what I said. What is it? Very confusing conversation. Anyway, there is some special instruction to go with this stuff, which is take about uh, eight to nine cups in our measurements, dry cups, never take more than you eat. Okay. You're only allowed to collect enough for that given day. And you collect it on six days on the sixth day, take two servings because you won't be gathering any of it on the Sabbath. So those are the instructions. Finally, this, what is it? tasted like something that had been baked in olive oil, like wafers made with honey. Those are the two descriptions of it, like wafers made with honey baked in olive oil. And that's what the Israelites ate while they roamed in the desert for 40 years. Now it's important to remember what this whole plan was, which was to take the Israelites out of Egypt and bring them back into the promised land, Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. But right now, they're trekking through the wilderness. Right now, they're in this temporary home between three lands, essentially, right? The land we talked about last week, the one of plenty and polytheism, that's Ur. And that's the land that their ancestors had been called out of. Then there's the land of captivity and oppression, Goshen, talked about that last week too, which they had been delivered from. And then there's Canaan, the land of promise, which they were walking toward. And we'll talk more about those lands next week. But for now, let's fast forward into the story to the life and ministry of Jesus, where Jesus is about to preach one of the most difficult things he ever preached. Some people would actually call this the most difficult text in the New Testament, both because it's hard to interpret and because it's hard to swallow. This is John 6. Let me set it up. Jesus has just delivered one of those sermons to the religious people that had a polarizing effect. This happens to Jesus all the time, right? So some of the people who were implicated in it were intrigued and they wanted to hear more. And some of the ones who were implicated in it organized a committee meeting to try to figure out how to kill him, right? So this happens to Jesus all the time. There's some people who are like, that was great. We want to hear more. And there's other people like, let's kill him. You know, typical stuff. Well, Jesus takes a little trip across the Sea of Galilee after this, but the crowds that were intrigued by him, they wouldn't leave him alone. So as Jesus is trying to have a little alone time with his disciples on a mountain, the crowds come and Jesus looks up and he sees them approaching them, maybe trying to get close to them. And to make a long story short, Jesus ends up feeding all of those people, 5,000 men with five loaves of barley bread and two fish, 5,000 men. Now that might only feed two men sitting here today, right? You take a fish, I'll take a fish and we'll split the bread in half. So this miracle, I mean, it astonishes the people. And John says that Jesus perceived that they wanted to come and take him by force to make him their king. So he withdrew. He, he left. He went away to the mountain by himself. Well, the night comes and the next morning, the people notice that one of the boats is gone, but they're like, man, we never saw Jesus get into the boat. So they start trying to figure out where he went. And again, to make a long story short, they chase him down, they find him and they begin a conversation with him. And they ask him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus doesn't answer, but he says, look, The only reason 
You're stalking me. The only reason you're chasing me down is because I gave you free food. That's the only reason you're here. You got free food. You're not here because you're interested in what exactly that meant. That was just bread. It spoils. It's temporary, right? What you need is bread that sustains you for eternal life. This is starting in verse 30 in John chapter six. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread for it from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, Give us this bread always. We always would love to have access to that bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jumping down 12 verses. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that manna, which your ancestors ate and died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Now, when many of the disciples heard it, they said, man, this is a difficult teaching. Who can accept it? But Jesus being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, guys, I was completely joking, like totally tricked you. No, he doesn't. He says, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It's a spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. So have you ever been reading through the Bible or listening to one of these teachings and you think, man, that's really strange or that's really difficult and I'm not sure I like it. Well, this is one of the few times where you actually get some affirmation because the people listening to Jesus say, man, this is super weird. And they're pretty unsure of what he's talking about. In fact, a few verses later in John 6, 66 says this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. Now we're not talking about people in the crowd here. We're talking about disciples That's a specific word. These are people who have maybe already left behind everything in order to follow Jesus, in order to learn from Jesus, in order to have their lives shaped by Jesus's teaching. And these are the people who are turning around and walking away because this is a difficult teaching. So it's no surprise that this text has provided a lot of controversy for the church over the past many centuries. It's a hard teaching. In fact, almost all of the division that has happened within the church over exactly what happens at communion, at the Lord's Supper, at the Eucharist comes from this teaching of Jesus. John 6. So how are we to understand it? Well, we believe you always interpret scripture in light of other scripture. And we believe in the big narrative. So what happened thousands of years before in the story often informs later parts of the story. I believe that's certainly the case with this one. 
And we don't even have to use our imaginations to bridge the gap to, to find some place that talked about bread and try to fit these things together because the crowd's questions and Jesus' answers bring us back to the, to the descendants of Abraham wandering around in the desert eating manna. They say, we want a sign from heaven like the bread from heaven Moses brought when our ancestors were in the desert. And Jesus says, Moses didn't bring that manna. God did. And God is sending bread from heaven even now. And they're looking around saying, where's this bread? I don't see any bread on the ground. And, and Jesus says, I am the bread. And I'm the one who's giving life to the whole world. So Jesus compares himself to manna in the desert. What does that mean? Well, remember that the Israelites have only known a life of captivity. They don't know how to be a free people. They've spent their whole life here. So the manna in the desert is his provision for them, but it's not just his provision for them. It is his teaching for them. Like God is giving them a lesson every morning when they wake up, a lesson about trust. Gather only enough for today. Live your day. Learn to trust that he'll provide for tomorrow when it comes. For now, just be sustained in what he has already provided on this day. Does that sound familiar? Give us this day our daily bread. Trust that the God who delivered you from captivity will lead you to the land he promised you. Trust his word. Sound familiar? Man does not live by bread alone, but by the very words of God. People of the promise, he is taking you somewhere. He'll get you there because he is good and he is able. You're his children after all. Don't take your eyes off of your father. He's got this. But this is a lot harder than it seems, right? Eating the same food over and over and over and over again, no matter how delicious it is, well, that gets exhausting. So having not arrived yet in the promised land, the Israelites get frustrated. And at one point, they even say this, in Egypt, we could eat all the fish we wanted. And there were cucumbers, melons, onions, and garlic, but we're starving out here. And the only food we have is manna. This is the verse that tells us that they didn't have tacos because they're reminiscing about cucumbers. Okay. But catch that last sentence. The only food we have is this manna. The only food we have is that thing that God miraculously provides for us every single day. That thing that actually has this really delightful taste, even though it doesn't have to have any taste at all. We're getting sick and tired of that provision. That's sometimes hard for us too, isn't it? To trust, to live in the freedom that he's given us. Like, cause sometimes we, we want to go back to Egypt. See, we're, we're a lot like the Israelites. We found ourselves in the middle of a desperate life at one point and we cried out to God and he showed up in a powerful way and he brought us up out of that captivity. He made a covenant with us. He gave us a type of freedom that we weren't accustomed to a type of freedom that maybe we couldn't even recognize as freedom because we had spent so much of our, our lives living as captives and we were led by cloud and by fire through this wilderness, trying to live on this earth in a kingdom we can't see with a king we can't see, trying to live in this new identity we've been given, the one that distinguishes us from other cultures, all the cultures around us, living as children of the promise, even though we've not yet fully taken a hold of it. So we're a lot like the Israelites, but we're also very different from the Israelites. See, they had manna. What is it? Gone by the afternoon, fleeting, temporarily satisfying, nourishing their bodies so they could continue their lives on the earth. And that gets boring after 40 years, but we have Jesus in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, and through the night, the word who sustains everything that lives and moves, nourishing us in a way that bread never could unraveling himself. As we explore his endless mystery, full of wonder, full of beauty, deep, profound, unending, unrivaled, unparalleled, unfailing. So when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's not insinuating that we engage in some type of cannibalism or anything weird like that. Although should be pointed out that he intentionally didn't make that clear to his audience. 
which is obvious by the fact that many of them walked away because of it. But what he's doing is he's talking about himself as the sustaining presence in our lives, that those who feast on his words, those who chew on the reality of his kingdom and his truth will have eternal life. And this is evident by Peter's answer to Jesus's question. When everyone else walks away, Jesus asks the 12, do you want to go away also? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, where else would we go? To who else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. So, What is the Egypt that you continue to be called back to? What is the Egypt that you continue to go back to? Let me give you some examples. Maybe your Egypt is your idea of success because you were raised your whole life. People telling you, hey, this is what it looks like to live a life that is successful and the American culture. And so you invested yourself in success. It looks like that. But when you met Jesus and you got introduced to this kingdom, you got a different idea of success, a different perspective on leadership, a different perspective of what it would look like to come to the end of your life and be satisfied with how you lived it. But guess what? Every morning when you wake up and you get in your car and you drive to work, you are pulled back to Egypt because you want that image of success, right? You want to be successful in the eyes of all the people around you. So you're, you're called back to Egypt, but you've been called out of that. Maybe you spend your whole life being told by people that you're, you're not good enough. And so you, uh, you have lived in isolation. You've felt rejection. You, you are on anxiety medication. You're on depression medication. These are, these are things about your life that, that you struggle with. Like you, you, you feel like you're in bondage. That's, that's Egypt. But through Jesus, you've actually been called out of your loneliness. You've been called out of your isolation. You've been called out of your, your desperate uh, uh, sense of, of anxiety and, and depression. You've been called out of those things and you've been given a new identity in Jesus. He tells you who you are. But guess what? Every morning when you wake up, you're tempted to go back to Egypt because some of the, some of the things that have made you feel isolated and rejected in your life, I mean, they're still there, right? Maybe it's some kind of dependence that you have on a chemical substance. Maybe it's some kind of addiction that you have, like a porn addiction, and you keep running back there. You keep going back to Egypt. Let me tell you this morning that Communion is a time for you to remember that you have been called out of that. And even if you were on your way back to Egypt, starting this week, no, you have been called out of that. You have been invited into the land of Canaan. You've been invited to take this journey toward this promised land, this better way of living. You've, you've, you've been invited to this new identity. And while you're struggling to get there, While you're in the wilderness of getting there, Jesus alone is your sustaining presence. He is with you. He is nourishing you with everything you need to live this new life of freedom. So it's time for our faith to rise up, for our hearts to believe that he is with us. Even when our eyes can't see, we will trust the voice that is leading us somewhere.